now are for the Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes, and we appreciate you giving. It's a blessing to see you today. Uh, everyone, we're going to do birthdays and anniversaries now, and we have this small church over here that Jackie uh, Sinton made for us. If you have a birthday, come up and put an offering in. You can do a dollar change, anything that you want to give in honor of your birthday, okay? So let's all stand and sing happy birthday, and if you've had a birthday or in July or have a birthday in July, come down and put money in. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Take Jesus as your Savior. And then you'll have two. Yay. Happy birthday, Karen. When's your birthday? The sixth. The sixth. Oh, the what? Wednesday. This We're celebrating just for you. <laughs> With a low country bowl and a hamburger and hot dog. <laughs> I'm getting nods from the preacher. Okay, let's do the anniversaries. If you have an anniversary this month, last month was my anniversary, and I said, come and put down in the church what you know what you feel like it's worth. Steve put a penny in. That's why he's not in here this morning. He's not showing his black eye. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, here we go. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to I guess we didn't have any anniversaries. Remain standing as we sing uh, Psalms 113. This is a test of your memory choir. Come on up. We'll see how much you remember. standing for opening prayer. Well, hello and welcome to Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. My name is Colin Terenzini. I'm the pastor here, and we just want to say thank you for choosing to worship with us. Uh, when you came in this morning, you were given a bulletin, and um, real quickly, in that bulletin, you're going to find a connections card. If you are our guest this morning, we want to say thank you for choosing to worship with us. You are our honored guest. Would you go ahead and fill that out, and you can place it in the offering as it passes by? But it's a good day in God. God's house. We have a lot of things to be excited for and to praise this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come before you unworthy, broken, sinful people, but we have confidence and faith that we step into the presence of 
of an unbreakable and unshakable king. And so, Father, I just pray right now that you would meet with us today. I pray that you would bring a celebration like Shaw's Creek has never even seen before. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would meet with us, that we would be convicted, that we would be encouraged, that we would leave here changed and transformed. Use us, mold us. We love you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this point in time, I'm going to take Trinity, and we'll start walking back. Go ahead and uh, have a seat. choir holy spirit thou art welcome as the choir comes down take a red hymnal this time oh we're no i'm jumping the gun i'm so sorry we've got somebody to dunk well what a time of celebration today we get to celebrate and witness Trinity McCombs uh, come forward in baptism. So I'm going to invite Trinity down. It's a little slick. So. so Trinity is part of the, the McCombs crew. And um, a, a few weeks ago, um, we gave a gospel presentation. And lo and behold, Trinity said, yes, I need, I need the gospel. I need Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. He repented of his sins and he trusted in, by faith, Jesus Christ. And now he takes the next steps of obedience in baptism. So I'm going to ask him to kind of situate right here. Yep. 
All right, Trinity. Upon your profession of faith, my brother, well, let me ask you before, uh, have you repented of your sins? Yes, sir. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, now, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Thank you, brother. Hey, let me tell you something. That never gets old. We will fill up this baptistry a, a thousand times. Jesus changes everything. Amen? Let's celebrate. I get so excited. Now, stand up and take your red hymnal, the red one. The Comforter has come. Sing out. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human will. 406, let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound. The Sing till the echoes fly above the vaulted sky and all the saints above to all below reply. it out. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, Charles Creek. Hope everyone's having a good day today. Get your bulletin and uh, let's look at a few things. As already has been mentioned, this Wednesday night, 515, up at the shed, Low Country Bowl. She's being quiet back here. She must have got prayed through this week. We're going to have all the fixings. We're bringing the side dishes, which includes desserts as well, right? Correct. And I heard there's going to be hamburgers and hot dogs for those of us that don't d eat fish a lot, okay? Or whatever's in it. So that's okay. We're going to get together for fellowship, inviting the community, bring you friends, bring you families. I understand there's, he's going to Charlotte Tuesday, Wednesday, is that right? And getting how much? 60 pounds of crawfish, okay? 60 pounds of crawfish, then there's shrimp coming, and Ricky's bringing shrimp from, okay, and where's the corn and everything else coming from? Anyway, that'll be the thing we'll find out, okay? Ingles. <laughs> okay, but we're going to get together, and we are going to have fun food and fellowship. We will not have choir practice. We will just be up there. But choir, you need to come and eat and enjoy the fellowship together. Christmas in July, the toy drive is on. My understanding, the collection boxes, they're down here in the fellowship hall, I believe. Is that right, Pat? 
and one's out there. So there's two collection boxes. Um, if you need information, see Miss Pat uh, Thomas. She's over here on the side. Wave at us, Pat, so everybody knows who you are. Okay. And if you would rather give money, you can do it through the church, but you've got to, got to, got to mark your check or put it in an envelope so that we know where it goes. And when we get all of that, then we can make the one check out and pass it on to the powers that be for the Christmas in July. So just please, please mark your check. Uh, you see the child care volunteers. And then look at the bottom, Chosen Road. Now, if you like bluegrass gospel, you're going to love these guys, okay? I have listened at them and heard of them before. Pastor somehow had a connection in the group and was able to get them for us. They'll be here August the 14th on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock. So tell your friends, we're going to promote on the sign, I'm going to get it on the radio, but tell your friends and your family, come join us for an evening of fellowship and music. We have more lined up coming this fall, and we'll be letting you know about that. Miss Kathy, if you'll come now and lead us in sweet, sweet spirit. They have to keep me straight. Y'all stand up and take your blue hymnal this time, 243, 243. And I love the sweet spirit of this church. 243. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. Because it needs to be a surprise this morning. 
So you just leave that right there, and okay. you go down there and stay with your wife. Okay. Listen to me better this time than when you did and brought the snow with you. Okay. okay? Yep. I'll bring you back up here in just a minute, I promise. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a little scared, I'll be honest with you. I am too. <clears throat> well, as you know, I was on the search committee. And Joe and a few of us was on the search committee, and we had looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And Joe found this resume, and Joe being the salesman that he is, he was like, you just got to look at this. You got to look at this guy. You got to look at him. You got to look at him. You got to read it. You got to read it. We need to call him. I mean, just, okay. <laughs> now, I'm the analyzer, Okay. And he's the salesman. And it was so beautiful how God brought us together. And I say this sincerely. I appreciate Joe's consistency and his push. Because he heard something that we all eventually heard. And I think you know where I'm going with this. We got a resume from a 30-year-old northerner. For a southern church, Lord help us, what's going to happen? That's why I asked Joe many times, are you sure, Joe? Are you sure? Got his resume, read his resume. Three things stood out to me in that resume. Bring glory to God, proclaim the gospel, and serve the local church and community. Did you hear what I said? I think we've seen those in the last three and a half, four months. Then we got to the interview, December 15th, right before Christmas. He's sick with COVID. I'm not sure it was the whole family. To ha you had had it, right? You was getting over it. Okay. Anyway, he was sick with COVID, so I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. But there were some things he said during that interview, sick with COVID. First thing stood out in my mind. Get with God before I get with people. He needs to be fed. Because I asked him, I said, what do you do for you? I know as a Sunday school teacher, I constantly give, give, give. And I know what I have to do for me. And I'm not a shepherd. God didn't call me to that. And I want to know, what do you do to take care of Colin? Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen and John fifteen five is his two scripture references he went to. One last statement or two last statements he made in the interview: the Lord prepares us for the journey. Man, have I ever learned that in the last three years? Walk slow and steady. Well. I thought, Kathy, you're not the only one who had to eat crow after talking to Joe after I heard all that and had to ask for forgiveness. I didn't ask Joe, not yet. But I listened to those things that were said. And I went back and I reread the resume and I even read it this morning and this weekend. And in his skill set, these were his words. I communicate spiritual matters and enjoy being able to comfort people in need. I am very interactive with the people of the local church. I am a pastor that is passionate, not just with preaching, but also with interactions and times of counseling. I don't know about you, but that I found that out personally. Very personally, I found it out through my journey, through our journey, through the journey as a church, through our journey individually. What I appreciate about him and his family the most is, is what you see is what you get. He's the same in the pulpit as he is out here when he's talking to you. I look back this morning and he was out here praying with somebody right before church. And I'm thinking, Lord... We got to get service started. Here I am, the analytical one, okay? 
But then the Lord says to me right there at that piano this morning, what's it about, Kevin? What are we here for? Well, over the last three and a half months, I think there's been two funerals and some other difficult situations, and he stuck with us. But I pray and we stick with him as well. Pastor, if you'd bring your bride up here, please. This was this was uh, not my idea, but I'm not going to blame who it was. It wasn't Joe, don't worry. <laughs> but we love and appreciate you and your family. I guess what I love and appreciate the most is that you remind us constantly it's not about Colin Terenzini, but it's about Christ, and it's about the kingdom. You do it through your family, through the support and the love of your beautiful bride, and we are so thankful. And we've just got a few cards of appreciation to say how much we love you, and you give them to her, especially if there's anything in them, and that way it won't go to the clingers, okay? <laughs> We love you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm through, man. What am I supposed to do after that? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was a real shocker today, and uh, I, I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know how better a better way to say it other than. Uh, uh, we're here for for the long haul, you know. We're we're here, and we want to grow with with you guys personally, spiritually. Uh, we want to grow with this church corporately, and uh, I can't think of a of a better church that God could have placed me in because I don't believe there is one. So thank you, thank you very much. At this time, we will uh, continue to worship, and we will walk our way into uh, our time of tithes and offerings. And so I'm going to ask that the ushers come forward, and um, <clears throat> we are a member-attended, supported church, which means that um, th the reason we're able to serve the community and the local body is by your faithfulness in your tithes and offerings. So above all, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Brother Joe, would you pray? Almighty oh God, thank you already for what's happening. We do thank you, God, for our God. Praise you, clothing you, Holy Spirit, God, hiding down the cross of Jesus, your own God, what you want us to do this morning, God, to be my eyes. There are strength in your word. So much to pray for you. God, pray for Christians. Move those books. Lay the burden down. God, knowing this offer is always up to you. Here, we pray with you. God, we thank you for that gift of that hand of that life. Down the course of our whole church. Lord, we give that part of that that you blessed us with, Lord God. We pray that you give us wisdom and how to send it.
Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of James. We are going to be in James chapter 4, specifically looking at verses 7 through 10. As you turn there, let me just give a little bit of background context. Um, We continue... I'm turning on my microphone. I think I'm on now. We continue to be in the book of James looking at faith and works. We see that James is writing this letter to the Jewish Christians that are being persecuted. We see that there are many problems, though, within the group of believers, such as taming their tongues from sharp and harsh words, seeking the right kind of wisdom, which is godly wisdom, and not starting quarrels, as they have tended to do. However, while all that may take place, it is vital to understand that this is still a letter to Christ followers, a people that have realized their sinfulness and have called on the name of the Lord to be saved. They are repentant believers. Everything that James calls them to do would not be possible if they were not in a right standing relationship with God. James is not calling people who don't know Jesus to act as if they do know Jesus. He is calling a people who are saved to be sanctified. Let's read this together. James chapter 4, 7 through 10. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let us pray. Father, we just ask that the words on these pages by your Holy Spirit would illuminate to us. They would draw conviction that we would repent of things within our lives that we need to give to you. Father, I pray that for the one that may be here this morning that feels worthless, that you would remind them that they are created in your image and there is worth and value to them. Father, I pray for the one who feels helpless that they can find help in you. For the one that feels tired that you have called them to cast all their cares onto you for you care for them. For salvation, I pray that you would draw them to yourself and let them know that they, all they do, all they can do is call on the name of the Lord for salvation. Father, be, be, be much in our time today. We love you so much and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Vance Havner is quoted by saying, a wife who is 85% faithful to her husband is not faithful at all. There is no such thing as a part-time loyalty to Jesus Christ. In his book, One Crowded Hour, Tim Bowden describes an incident in Borneo in 1964. Nepalese fighters known as Gurkhas were asked if they would be willing to jump from airplanes into combat against the Indonesians. The Gurkhas didn't clearly understand what was involved, but they bravely said that they would do it, asking only that the plane fly over a swampy area and no higher than 100 feet. When they were told that the parachutes would not have time to open at the height, the Gurkhas said, oh, you didn't mention a parachute. James is calling for loyalty and dedication. James calls us to not be complacent to throw off this illusion that so many of us have bought into that there is such a term called a casual Christian. Friends, there is no such thing. James gives us multiple uh, imperatives or multiple commands. And I want to go through those real quick. In the verses that we just read, submit, resist, draw near, cleanse, purify, lament, mourn, weep, May your laughter be turned to mourning, joy be turned to gloom, and humble yourselves. In that, there's three promises. So when it says resist, we have the promise that the devil will flee. 
when we are told to draw near to the Lord, that the Lord would draw near to us. And when we are told to humble ourselves, we are reminded that God will raise us up. But instead of going through each and every one of those step by step, I believe that we can look at this in three topics. So I'm going to ask three questions for us to, to, to ask that I believe will point to James's exhortation for the Christian life. If you're taking notes today, the title of my sermon is The Death of Casual Christianity. The first question that we ask ourselves is how are we viewing God? How are we viewing God? James brings up immediately to submit to God. This deals with his posture or the posture that we have towards God. James calls us to look at our posture of God. We need to look at how we submit to God. James, again, is writing to these Christ followers. He understands that they have been bought with the blood of Jesus, and now he is calling them to look introspectively how they are viewing God and his word. Are we submitting to it? Are we submitting to the Word of God? Are we reading the Word of God or are we letting the Word of God read us? Are we bending the knee to the King of Kings or in our minds are we expecting God to bend His knee to our wants, our ways, and our will? Revelation 1.17 And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And then just a little while later in Revelation, we see that John is emotional because he believes no one is worthy to open the scroll who appears no other than the lamb that was sacrificed for you and for me. The one uh, where the creatures begin to sing this heavenly song that gives him the worthiness that he deserves, that him gets, he gets the glory that he deserves. This, church, is the posture that you and I should have. When we think about God as a casual Christian, we walk and we're just kind of willy-nilly and whatnot, and God calls us to fear Him in a healthy way. God calls us to love Him. God calls us to search for Him. God calls us to, to live our lives through the framework and the lens of the gospel. That is what we should be doing. We should be in reverence and fear. We should be crying out like Moses did. Let me see your face. I, I mentioned this last week, I believe. But imagine if this church would get on their faces and pray the way that Moses did. God, let me just see your face. God declines. He says, no, but hey, in that rock, I'm going to hide you in a little cleft. A little cleft. And when I'm passing by, I want you to look and you're going to see my back. And he comes down off the mountain and the people tremble. They didn't want even him to be near because he was glowing. This same instance happens at the, 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 the Mount of Transfiguration. Friends, when we get with God, when we see Him, it will change our view of him, of us, of sin, of everything else. So we ask the question, what is our posture to God? Not only that, what is our proximity to God? Right? So he tells us to submit, but he also says draw near, and he will draw near to us. What is the proximity to God? You can try to get close to God, but if your position isn't in a right standing by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the good news of the gospel, then friends, it is no use. James calls the believers of Christ to draw near, and in turn, God will draw near to you and to me. You can submit to God all day long, and you can resist the devil, but the redeemed heart longs for intimacy with God. The Redeemer. The idea of drawing near to God, this is a, a Levitical concept that goes all the way back to Exodus 19.22. 
It says, also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord breaks out against them. And Ezekiel 44, 13, and they shall not come near me to minister to me as a priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their ab abominations which they have committed." We know because of the gospel that the veil has been ripped in two from the top to bottom, uh, which separated the holy of holies from the rest of the courts. We know now that we can talk to God, that we have a friendship with God, that God is closer than any friend and closer than any family member. In Matthew 27, I don't want us to miss that portion, and we've talked about it before, but if you're not familiar with Christianity or some of the biblical history, in the Old Testament, there was something called the temple. And I want to go there. So Matthew 27, we see the earth shaking, the rocks quaking, and the veil, this veil being ripped in two from the top to the bottom. What is the significance of that? Well, back in the temple, there were sections of the temple. These were called courts. The outer court held non-Israelites and ceremonial, ceremonially unclean people. The inner courts, this was for the Israelite men. And then within that, there were the Holy of Holies. This was a room that held the Ark of the Covenant, signifying the presence and the manifestation of God. Only the high priest could go in there one time of year. And so... What separates the Holy of Holies from the rest of the courts? This 30-foot massive veil. This wasn't a, uh, a bed sheet that we hang up to be a makeshift curtain for the night. No, this is a very thick, huge veil. It was 30 feet high. And what happens in Matthew 27? The gospel happens, the crucifixion happens, all of a sudden, while Jesus is up on the cross, things start happening, the sky goes dim and gloom, the rocks start cracking and breaking, the earth begins to shake, and that temple veil is torn from top to bottom, signifying that there is a new covenant, there is a new way to get to God, and it is through Jesus Christ. This picture of us drawing near is felt in the Psalms where the psalmist says, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. I want to paint a picture for just a moment. Did you know one million earths would be needed in order to equal the massive size of the sun? One million earths. And did you know at present... The biggest known star is named, I'm going to mess this up, U.Y. Scuddy. U.Y. Scuddy. This bright red supergiant is situated 9,500 light years away in the Scudum constellation. The said star is larger than the sun by more than 1,708 times. Think about that for just a a moment. It would take a million Earths to reach the massive size of the sun, and it would take 1,708 suns to reach the massive size of this star's. Genesis 1.16. God made the two great lights, the, great, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Notice how the writer there just kind of throws in the stars. Isaiah 40, 26 says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. No, not one of them is missing. Friends, that very same God wants to draw near to you. The second question for us to ask that I believe will point to, to James's commands for our Christian walk, James exhorts us to resist Satan. So we ask the question, how are we viewing Satan? How are we viewing Satan? 
Those, this word resist means to take a stand against. You know why Jesus has to die? Because of sin. You know why there's sin in this world? Do you know why there's brokenness in this world? Because Adam and Eve did not take a stand against the devil. They did not resist him. And they listened to the lies. They listened to it. The Bible is clear according to 1 John 3, 8. He who sins of the devil... He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God has manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We are neither, or we are either under the lordship of Satan, or we're under the lordship of the Savior. But there's no in between. So many times, uh, not here, but when I was working at jobs, uh, 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 secular jobs, whether it be Enterprise Rent-A-Car, whether it be GE, whatever the jobs that I had, I would look forward to the days of my vacation. I would long for those days. I would look forward to those weekends. I would look forward to the day where I didn't have to get up and punch a clock and go. I look forward to just be able to hang out with my family. And because I, I, I may have liked my job, hey, I may have loved my job, but at points in time you get a break where you say, hey, I need a little bit of a rest. We've been going, we've been doing great work, but hey, time out. I need a reprieve. I need, I need some R&R. I need to take a vacation, right? Even with maybe your best of friend, you could spend so much time together, and then all of a sudden you say, hey, all right, we need a few days apart. This is a little bit too much. Okay. However, that is not the case when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ. The more we draw near to Him and He draws near to us, the more we have a peace that surpasses all understanding, the more we have a joy, the more that we have confidence, the more that we have victory, the more that... And I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel saying that you're going to be victorious. I'm saying that by the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are all victors. That's what we are. And so... That's the way that the more we draw and press into him, the more he's pressing into us, hey, we're going to look a little bit different. Our words are going to be a little bit sweeter. Our time in the word of God in the morning or at night will be just a little bit longer. From that, it'll change the way we act towards our spouses, our parents, our kids our co-workers, our best friends, people in the church. James explains, though, that this is the way that Satan will flee. We see this story in Luke where J Jesus is tempted by Satan himself. Jesus passes the test, but what does Luke 4.13 say? Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. I want us to realize that as we get closer to Jesus and He's giving closer to us, as we submit and as we understand our posture of God and as we resist Satan, He will flee from you and I. But I want us to look at the words on the page. He departed from Him until an opportune time. What does that mean? That he is looking for an opportune time to creep in and to ruin what is going on. So I say this as a pastoral application. We've had victory. We just celebrated Trinity's baptism. I'm hoping that we see more and more of that. I hope that we get a water bill that's off the charts because we just can't handle how much we're doing baptism. I, 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 that's what I hope. But, but here's the thing. This pastoral application... Understand, do not give the opportunity to Satan. Don't do it. Don't do it. And the Bible is clear that if we are submitting to God and we are drawing near to Him and he, Him to us and we are resisting Him, that He is going to flee. But when we give opportune times, He creeps in and He uses that to His advantage. So many people come around saying, Satan is really tempting me today or the devil just won't quit. Remember the words of James, you want the devil to flee, draw near and submit to the Lord while resisting Satan. The devil will often offer us the nicest things though. 
the nicest, shiniest, newest things of this world. The things that bring a, a quick pleasure, a quick fix, a quick feeling, a quick decision. And so many times we fall to it. So many times we go towards it, we gobble it up. Mark Twain said, there is a charm about the forbidden that makes it unspeakably desirable. When one of my first jobs out of high school was uh, I worked for TD Bank um, as a bank teller and they send you to um, uh, training for a week or so and so I'm in this training and we had to spend a day of doing kind of detection of fake money and so they show you all the eight or whatever it is, different things on a, on a bill uh, where you can detect if it is fraudulent. But then above that, you know what they said to us? They said, you know the best way to detect fraud? Play with the real. Get to know the real. They said, you want to detect a fraud, a fraudulent bill, a fake bill? Feel the real stuff. Play with it. Get to know it better. I remember in high school, um, I, I became friends with my first set of twins. Now, I was nervous by this because they were identical twins. And I thought to myself in the beginning, there's no way I'm going to be able to tell these two apart. I'm going to call Jeff Mark, and I'm going to call Mark Jeff, and I'm going to insult them. And I realized as I got to know them better, qualities and characteristics stuck out. And now, while someone may say, well, they look identical, I could say, oh, that one's Mark, that one's Jeff. Why do I say that? Because so many times, the devil will mask himself as a blessing, as something good, as the voice coming from down rather than the voice of the earth. And the best way for us to understand if that is the voice of God or fraud is by spending time with the genuine Lord of Scripture, the, the one who has brought everything into existence, the one who sustains it, the one who has died for us. That's the best way. You want to know what fraud is? You want to see if something is of God or of the devil? Spend more time with God. I guarantee you, you'll be able to tell. But well, friends, the Lord, the things of the Lord are worth the wait. It's worth the time. It's worth the submission. It's worth the humility. It's worth it because it brings Him honor. It brings Him honor. We know. Here's the thing, folks. We know the end of the story. We know that one day Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire and we, he will have no more stronghold on our lives. He will not tempt. He will not deceive. He will not roam. He won't. He doesn't stand for eternity. Only the King of kings and the Lord of lords stands the test of time. Amen. The last question for us to ask not only how we are viewing God and not only how we are viewing Satan, but how are we viewing sin? Do we view it with this kind of willy-nilly? Are we casual about our sinfulness? Because James addresses our sinfulness right here. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. These are Old Testament terms. Uh, this goes back to Exodus 30, 17 through 21, where the priests would have to ceremonially wash themselves before they approached God. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it in between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash the water, or they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. So this is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. That is what James is commanding on the outside. 
But it's more than just the outside shell of the person. Remember, he is talking to people who are Jewish. When he says the things like cleanse and purify, their mind is already going back to the ceremonial laws. And he can, he, he, this is a way that he can speak their language in their context. And he's saying purify. He's saying the Lord cares about holiness. It's so much more than what's on the outside shell of a person. We can have the nicest clothes. We may not even cuss. We may even pray and go to church. However, if the Lord hasn't consecrated you and purified your heart by the work of the gospel, then it's no use. This is a side off, off topic. I was watching the news and... Um, awful tragic story about one of the worst smuggling cases in America. Um, I can't, I think it was in either Texas or, or California, um, and I'm not going to give facts because I, I'm, again, just kind of shooting this out here right on the spot, but one of the things I heard about it is they had, um, they had bodies that were deceased in the back, and there was people crying for help in the back of this truck. And one of the things that the smugglers had tried to do is they tried to take steak seasoning and throw it on the bodies to help with the smell. Guess what? You can put all the refresheners, all the seasoning, all the thing on a dead corpse. At the end of the day, it still is a dead corpse. And when I think about James and his command, he's saying purify and cleanse your hands, but before we can cleanse our hands and purify us, we need to deal with the utmost matter, which is do you have and do you know Jesus Christ? James addresses our complacency against sin. The people that James is addressing is laughing and have joy in the midst of their sins. That's why he says, you know, change your joy and your laughter to mourning and weeping. They aren't falling on their knees and weeping. They aren't trying to fight it. They aren't resisting it. They are trying to live in a casual, complacent, apathetic manner. And God calls us to be a people. If you are in Christ Jesus, He calls us to make war. He calls us to do that. Do you want to know when revival will come? It's not when we vote this way. It's not when we act this way. It's not when we attend this. It's not when we give to this. It's when we realize the holiness of God and the severity of our sin. And it's when we fall on our knees and weep over it and want this nation to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is when. C.H. Spurgeon, and I can attest to this, as the salt, this is a quote by him, as the salt flavors every drop in the Atlantic, so does sin affect every atom of our nature. It is so sadly there, so abundantly there, that if you cannot detect it, you are deceived. It's uh, beginning of the week, my family got to go to Myrtle Beach, and I think it was the very first time when Haddon in London tasted salt water. And I could be wrong on that one, but I think it is the first time. And I, I, I'm holding Haddon, and I'm taking him out there, and the waves are crashing, and we get to the point where a big wave comes, and he tastes this for the first time, and his face just turned. And you could tell he was not happy with Dad for letting this salt water touch his tongue. And and so obviously, we know it's there. We see it. We see the effects of it. Next week, we're doing, this will be the third week, or the third funeral in the last three or four months. You want to know why that is? Because of brokenness and sin. That's why. As we conclude today, as we look back at what we just talked about, we ask the question and we give three questions to us to be introspective on. How are we viewing God? Are we viewing Him with submission? Are we viewing Him with reverence? Are we fearing Him? Are we drawing near to Him so that He draws near to us? How are we viewing Satan? Are we allowing Him to stick for the party? 
Or are we resisting Him so much that He realizes that He is not wanted and He has no way, no foothold to get in? And then how are we viewing our sin? I hope that this church would be broken for our sins personally. That we would call on the name of the Lord. That He would rid us of it. And that we would grow in holiness. One of the key application points to what we just read is verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. You want to know what a gospel-centered humility is? It's submitting to God. It's resisting Satan. It's drawing near to Him. It's hating our sin. It's mourning over our sin. Remember today, if you're taking notes, that the devil runs when we resist him and submit to God. Remember today, if you're taking notes, the Lord draws near to us when we draw near to Him. And remember, if you're taking notes today, we are made high when we humble ourselves. But as Kevin comes and plays, here's the question. As we said before, I don't want you to to think for just even a second. The preacher preached this morning on ten things that I have to do. I don't want that. And if I've done that, then I've missed the mark in preaching. That James is writing to a Christ-following people. That they have the Holy Spirit living inside of them and working through them. And so he is talking to Christians. If I stand up here and I call non-Christians to act like you're a Christ follower, then the most I'm doing is pouring salt or pouring steak seasoning on a dead body. I'm trying to make you smell good. I'm trying to make you look good. And I would be doing you and this church a disservice. Before you can ever say that you are good, you need to know Jesus. Because friends, you and I have missed the mark. We have sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. At the end of this world, at the end of your lifetime, you will get to a place and a point where you will stand before a holy and righteous God, and He will ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? And based upon your answer, based upon what you've done with Jesus in this life, you will either hear the words, depart from me for I never knew you, or well done, thy good and faithful servant. This is the greatest truth of the Bible, and it's the greatest decision that you have to make in this life. And if you've never put your faith and trust and hope into Jesus Christ, today could be the day. I'm glad you're here. You may have come to witness a baptism. You may be here from out of town. Whatever may be the reason why you're here, I believe that God has ordained you to be here. And this is what I know, that Jesus gives everlasting life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, do you know Jesus today? If you don't know Him in a personal, relational way, you can't say, hey, I I know Jesus. Let me tell you the good news of the gospel. We call the gospel, that's a churchy word. That means good news in Greek. And what is the good news? That while you and I can't buy our way into heaven, we can't borrow our way into heaven, we don't have good enough credit to work our way into heaven, we don't have a position that can get us to heaven, God knew that and God sent His Son to take on the punishment and the pain that was ultimately and should have been given to us. He went to the cross, He died, He was put in a tomb, and three days later... The stone was rolled away, that the tomb was empty, that Jesus lives and reigns in victory, and He says, whoever wants a relationship with Me, trust and believe in Jesus Christ. If that's you today, and you've never put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, and you want a relationship, would you, would you just put your hand up in the air? I'm not going to try to 
embarrass you or anything. I see those hands today. I see those hands. And I'm praising God for those hands. Here's what I know. I know that Jesus died for you and maybe this is the first time that you're hearing the Gospel. He loves you so much and He loves you so much that He died on a cross for you. If you put your hand up in the air with everyone else still closing their eyes, would you just look at me real quick? I see you. I see you. What we do is we call this the sinner's prayer. Now, the prayer doesn't save you. Your profession of faith, Jesus coming to, into your heart, and you repenting, that's what saves you. Repenting means that you've turned around 180 degrees. And so I just want to pray a prayer with you two. And you don't have to say it out loud. You could just say it in the quietness of your heart. Pray with me. God, we love you and thank you for today. I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that if I were to die today, I would be separated from you for all of eternity. But I realize that Jesus died for my sins. I place my faith today in Jesus Christ. I repent of my sins. And I ask the Holy Spirit to live in me. To work in me and to use me. Father, thank You for saving me. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can I, can I give a, 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 a word of encouragement? I don't know who said that we serve a dead God, but we do not. We just witnessed baptism in the beginning. And can I just say that the angels are rejoicing because two souls just profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Can we give it up for God still working? God is still on the move. He is not done yet. I think the best days of Shaw's Creek Baptist Church is still ahead. And to those two people that uh, said, hey, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus Christ. This is the greatest decision that you two could have ever made. I am proud of you. And we as a church family want to walk beside and alongside of you through this life. And so what I'm going to ask, if you have a bulletin, just to give me your name and so we can connect with you. And I'd uh, just for a minute, if you could come see me in the front, but, uh, but I'm proud of, of what God is doing here. I don't even know where I'm going with this, Kevin, but I think I kept everyone a little bit too long. I'm proud of this church and I want to thank everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be your pastor and thank you for coming to Shaw's Creek Baptist Church. It is wonderful to see everyone today. With that being said, God bless. Go be the church. I love you.